So we got people joining in here, moving in. Good, good. Always that wait for the processing. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. So make sure my phone is off and get an OCD. I'm checking it three times. <laughs> Just had somebody do that in the middle of a meeting. They were right up front and their phone went off. I'm like, really? So, all right. Welcome to our monthly call. We've got a few updates. We've got a couple of things going on. Um, I want to start off by saying thank you, uh, especially to our sponsor and Home Depot and all that they do. Um, sorry, I'm jumping around on you, Lori. Um, but I do want to say thank you to Home Depot for being a key sponsor they are an industry stalwart for us, and this has been a great relationship. So um, we're going to have a, a shorter meeting today. This is going to be Jeff Watson and myself, uh, both of us looking sharp in suits there, and we are relaxed on screen. So uh, we're going to give a little bit of relaxed perspective on a couple of things, especially regarding um, some legislative issues and a couple of things that are coming. And this is one of those things where I think you're going to hear some chicken little syndrome, like, oh my word, the sky's falling. Well, we want to give you some perspectives on it. So that's what we're going to kind of go into. But before we do that, I always need to give a disclaimer. So um, I'm not an attorney. Attorneys are bound by ethics. As a lobbyist, I don't know, oh, never mind. <laughs> so this is one of those things that, you know, we are not giving financial advice and we are not giving legal advice to you. Please check with your own financial advisors and your own attorney. Um, having said that, we are happy to discuss some of these legislative issues and move forward from there. So with that, we're going to roll into a little bit of what we do, which is, again, promote, protect, and educate. And folks, if you go to our website, happy to have you join. There are local associations, and I, I, I say this across the country over and over, there is no better way to keep your thumb on the pulse of what's going on in our communities than to be involved with your local real estate investor association. Um, the wealth of knowledge and the ability to bring people together, and whether you're experienced or brand new, this is the way to do it. So um, we're going to focus a little bit here on a couple of things. I want to give you some education, and oh, we did that part. Keep going. Keep going. So um, that's where you find the local RIA. There we go. All right. So here's what we want to talk about a little bit. Um how about if we go into a long discussion about the house and where they're at? And I don't mean just any house. I mean, the house in Washington, which is, oh my word. I, I am a fan of the phrase that compromise is the virtue of the unprincipled. And what that means, just so we are clear, is compromise is a virtue, is seen as a virtue by those who are unprincipled. The problem is, if you completely avoid compromise at all, you don't get anything done. And that is the situation we're seeing. We have lost almost two months so far this year because the Republicans in the House are more focused on, I want my way, or at least a half dozen to a dozen of them, than trying to work together to get things done. And with things heating up internationally, they are reading weakness in this country, and that is not a good thing. So that's what I'm gonna say about the political side of it and perspective, which of course means that there's nothing getting done in the house. Um, it's, it's a mess right now. And that means that even what the Senate is trying to do, they're not sure what they can move forward with because they're not sure what the house would even consider. Uh, so even the slow, deliberative body of the House or Senate is going even slower. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, I do want to mention, though, considering the global aspect, uh, there was a warning by the State Department regarding travel advisories and an international travel advisory. And why am I bringing that up? Because that also means that those folks that might be a problem are also being activated here locally. And there are more there's concern over or elevated concern over active cells, active problem causing. And that's a nice way of saying domestic terrorism or, or international terrorism on the domestic level. So be aware. Uh, 
you know, there's situational awareness, but there's also making sure that you're taking precautions, checking things out. And, and part of what I really want to encourage you on is resident background searches and making sure you're checking IDs, following up with paperwork, looking through those kind of things. Um, a lot of folks are going to need some place if they're causing problems, they're still probably going to need some place to stay. And chances are, if they're causing problems, they probably got some funding behind the scenes to do what they want to do and be here for a while. So just, I encourage you to do that. Be careful of the scams. There are a lot of people out there with a variety of scams and we're seeing more and more of them as we go into um, kind of the exiting of the, you know, all the, the federal money and free money that's out there. We're seeing scams on the increase. Um, and at the same time, we're also seeing municipalities continue with more restrictions on what kind of background checks you can do. And that's, Part of that's coming from the White House blueprint for runner rights. Um, part of it is just coming from an idea that if you are restricting criminals from coming, ex-criminals coming back into the system, that there's a problem there. And so trying to balance some of that out is really where we're at on that. So I just encourage you, make sure you're doing your due diligence on your background checks, applications, looking at those licenses to make sure they're legitimate. Um, and if you're at all intimidated, make a copy of it, move on, say we'll follow up and, and let the FBI know. There are different resources that you can reach out to and they are happy to follow up on it. You may not ever hear from them. That does not mean that they did not respond or follow up on it. So I just encourage you on that. So as we move into uh, fall and the Halloween season, I would be remiss if I didn't mention it's off your elections as well. Speaking of scary things and things that come around and go trick or treat, please give me some money. Um, give me your vote. But I will mention this. A politician is never more impressionable when the, than when they are campaigning. Right now is a time to really make your point. Um, bring out the local elected officials, the candidates who are running for office. Bring them out to meet with your groups. Go sit down with them. Have coffee. Yes, they are looking for money. They are also very impressionable at this point to understand who you are and want to learn who you are. Um, a lot of what these groups will do or these, these politicians will do, and I can tell you this from running and, and having run campaigns and been around folks, a lot of the meetings they go to, there's three, four, ten um, octogenarians. How's that? <laughs> How's that polite way of saying it? And they're kind of like, okay, I give my spiel. When they walk in and see a, a room full of business people, or they're meeting with a smaller group of business individuals who represent a larger group, that sticks with them. And now is the time that you impress upon their memories who you are for the next two to four years as they're going to be in office. So I just encourage you to really make sure you take opportunity. That may also mean showing up at some of their fundraisers. Those $25 to $50 events, show up at them. Show up a couple of times. You'd be amazed. Once they get to know you by name at those events, when you come in to testify or have a concern about an issue and you call, you get a much faster response. Are there quid pro quos? Absolutely not. There should not be. But this is about relationship development and getting to know people so that they have they know who the resources are in the community, who the real stakeholders are, and this is a way to plug in to do that. So I just encourage you to do that, especially as we continue to see with the White House um, blueprint for renters' rights rolling out in different facets of that. One of the ones I'll mention is we're looking at, and I'm going to use this kind of as a transition to where we're going with Jeff here in a few minutes, but the FTC has come out and said they're going to work on some new rules regarding junk fees. Great. The Federal Trade Commission is going to work on junk fees. Okay, so how much is that going to fall, fall over into what we're doing? So we're going to be looking at those kind of proposed rules, what we can do to send in letters on it. Um, additionally, there are potential rules coming out right now are, are being developed. They're announcing that they're going to come out from the EPA. And this is going to be on that favorite of all topics, lead. Lead paint lead dust, and how do you address it? Um, having, I, I can reach over and grab my little certificate that shows all my background stuff. 
Um, Anna, I know that you've been through some of these classes before and ah, the minutia. And when you start getting into the milligrams or micrograms, actually, of the amounts of dust that will qualify, they are looking at taking windowsill dust. The passage rate had been at 40 micrograms. They're going to reduce it down to 10 potentially. And, and by the way, you can't see that amount, just so you understand, you can't even see it. And that means that new buildings where there's no lead paint, but because they're in an urban setting, may still fail because of the amount of residual dust in the air. That's how low these standards will be dropping. Um, that's part of the concern. So I just want to give you a heads up. That's the kind of thing we're going to be aware of. And we will be getting ready to push back on that and joining with other housing groups to do just that. So those are the kinds of things rule-wise that are coming. Um, those are still in development process. And so we'll have some time to comment on them. Other rules like, um, Jeff, we, we we talked a little bit about HOTMA and what that means. And really what we're talking about is Fed rolling out with some some language to come in and say, okay, if you're one of our larger owners and you have all of this federal money wrapped into your properties, we want to tell you more about what you're going to do. And, and this is one of those problems when you're in bed with the government, there's more strings. And by the way, oh, there's more strings. And by the way, they can keep adding strings or chains or weights or however you want to look at it. That's part of the problem. So this is one that, quite frankly, it really does not focus or affect us at a smaller level. And what I mean by that is even, you know, I've got LIHTC properties with 60 units and 70 units and stuff like that. It, it's, it's will it have some minor effect on them? Potentially. Single families? No. Smaller properties? No. Unless you're doing federal um project-based Section 8, if you're not doing LIHTC, if you're not doing some of these larger properties and, and getting in full partnership, they're not going to affect us. So just understand that if somebody's throwing that out there. What could affect us though, and I always appreciate having our, our legal eagle on here, uh, is corporate transparency. Yeah. And, and Jeff, this is one that I mean, we, we could ask the question, how many people on here have an LLC? I can't raise enough hands for how many LLCs I have, right? Uh, ideally, you're going to have separate properties in separate LLCs. You know, they usually say the minimum, what, about $1,500 of valuation. You might want to look at the LLC and being separated. And typically, if you've got a bank loan on them, what does the bank want? They want that individual yeah. LLC, Correct. But, yep. but how do we use that LLC, not just for legal protection, but now they want to come in and do what? Jeff, walk us through this a little bit. What are we looking at with this new Corporate Transparency Act? Okay. Yeah, this is, this is another big reach. <laughs> and first of all, let make sure, I want to make sure that the audio is coming through clearly. Is it? It is. Good. All right, because I'm leaning back a little bit in order to let the lighting and all that other stuff work to, you know, you, all that. You, you don't want these kind of light bulbs? <laughs> well, I, I've i got such bright you don't overhead have that fluorescence. <laughs> I got such bright, bright overhead fluorescence because I, I need the light to see all the fine print I write. All right, so what is the Corporate Transparency Act? It's been cooking for a while, and now it's come out. The final rules are being published by FinCEN, F-I-N-C-E-N. Um, the idea behind it is a noble idea gone awry. Okay. The, 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 the belief is that if we know who owns these smaller LLCs, these smaller companies, then we can prevent money laundering. That's the, that's the story they sell. Now, do I think it's going to slow down money laundering? Absolutely not. Do I think that there's ways around it for money launderers? All day long. They're they're moving in that way. But I did, I will have to say this. One of the big 
five or six too big to fails has recently introduced a new policy that they have that um, they won't take a cash deposit unless you have an account with them. So that's cutting down on the smurfing that money launderers used to use. But let's go back to the Corporate Transparency Act. Oh, hold Let on. me just you just threw out the word smurfing? Smurfing. Yeah. Okay. Educate us. I got little blue guys on my mind. So when so part of okay, let me let me give you the education to back up. Um when I wear my board of director member, when I wear my member of the board of directors had a quest trust company, which is a state chartered financial banking institution regulated by the Texas Division of Banking, I have to undergo consistent training in anti-money laundering, bank secrecy, that kind of stuff. And so one of the most interesting training videos I took on the anti-money laundering started out with footage in Chicago, of all places, Jane, showing derelict abandoned houses with people lined up around the house holding on to 20 to 40 bucks a piece to buy their daily fix. That money is collected and it gets between two to five grand. And these people go to a bank and then they deposit it as cash into a bank account. And there's multiple deposits all over the nation to that same account every day, gets swept and it's gone. And that's part of money laundering. So the people who make the deposits are what they call Smurfs. Okay. So, Okay. So registering who the owner is of your new LLC or your new corporation is not going to stop a lot of this stuff. What they're trying to do is find out where the money's moving to. And what they're really trying to figure out is who's got it. And now let me tell you two things, good and bad. All right. Under the rules as they're proposed right now, the information that FinCEN is collecting or wants to be in collecting effective January of next year should be exclusive to FinCEN and other valid law enforcement agencies. Now that's the idealistic pie in the sky. We all know that the Chinese and the Russians are ready to hack that database as soon as it's opened up. The good news is right now, People, nosy neighbors and snoopers and trial lawyers and all the other people out there that we're all afraid of, they can't, from the comfort of their home, wearing their fuzzy slippers and pajamas, log on and see who now owns what LLCs, unless they're in certain states. And so that's that's so that FinCEN database will not be searchable by the general public. So for those who are people, if you're hearing somebody running around screaming about this, just kind of put that into place and so on, okay? The second thing is it's going to be available to law enforcement. It's going to be available, and it's going to get hacked and leaked. So let me tell you the first thing I think you should do, and that is go now and buy identity theft insurance. If you've got a couple of nickels together, if you've got a few assets, if some of your members have got some assets, go get some identity theft insurance, not credit monitoring, not, you know, this thing, but actual legitimate ID theft insurance. I actually carry two policies because I let them compete against each other. So, and I'm not going to tell you what companies I use because I don't want anybody to accuse me of pitching anything. Okay. So anyhow, um, get it. You're going to want to have it. It's been very helpful for me. It's prevented a few problems and just get it. Um, I don't want anybody to come back later on and say, oh, I formed an LLC. I registered my information. It got hacked. And now I've, my identity has been stolen. Guess what? Your identity has already been compromised multiple times already. So just go get it. The second thing I'm going to tell you to do, and this, I'm going to get into why we're going to do this, but I'm going to tell you the second thing to be proactive here. If you wait until after January to form your new LLC, you may run into a problem because the states are not yet synced up with the FinCEN database because FinCEN doesn't have it available yet. So that when you're forming your LLC, they want to know who's going to be the owners of it, who's going to have a 25% or greater interest in it. You may run into a problem. So if you think that you're going to need 
a couple of LLCs between now and the middle of next year, go file them now. Go file your articles of organization, get it open, pay the filing fee, and get the tax ID number now. You don't have to do anything more than that. And you, when you get your tax ID number, you can simply say it's not going to start business until December of 23. And so the IRS won't be looking for a tax return for a whole 12 months. So we'll be fine there. But go get it formed now so that then you have all of 2024 to then register that LLC and who are the owners of it instead of getting hamstrung. Oh, I'm Jeff. I'm trying to close on this deal. I create this LLC because I got this property under contract and I can't close because I can't get my LLC established because there's an issue with the state versus FinCEN. We want to avoid that. I don't want you to lose a deal because we have an Obamacare 2.0 computer rollout. Okay. How many of you remember what happened with Obamacare? The day that website was supposed to be live, it cratered. <laughs> yeah, it was... It and you know, and I, right. It was, it, yeah, it was, a, it was a complete total meltdown. So, I want you to be ahead of this. So, let's talk about what really is going on with this. It's nosy, it's invasive, but it's not the end of the world. There's a couple of things that I want you to do buy your ID theft insurance, form your LLCs, a couple of them in advance. I think a lot of you are probably the type that you've got more LLCs than you need. Great. But if you want a couple more, that's fine. Filing fees in the state of Ohio are 99 bucks for a brand new LLC. It's worth it. Some of the other states are a little more expensive. I feel sorry for those of you in Texas and in California because your filing fees are kind of pricey in those two states. But anyhow, um, get your LLCs for them. Get your tax ID number and then just let them sit. What, we, what I call just put them on the shelf. Let them sit there and wait. You don't have to worry about your operating agreement yet. You don't have to worry about your joint action of managers and members. You don't have to do your bank account yet. But just form your LLC, get your tax ID number, and sit and wait for when you need it. Okay. So what's going to happen is eventually all of the entities that you own and all of the entities that you form in the future, you're going to have to report with identifying information, including government-issued photo ID, passport, driver's license, anybody who is a owner of that entity of 25% or more, okay, 25% or more, they want to know who, con who controls, who calls the shots. They're trying to figure out where money's moving and how assets are moving around. And let's face it, those of us that are paying attention, we know, we know that a lot of money from illegal sales of narcotics in the United States is made in the United States, goes overseas, and then comes right back to buy real estate in certain areas of this country. We know it. They're trying to slow it down. They're trying to stop it. I'm fine with that. I don't think this is the best way to do it, but this is what they're doing. So now, let me get, let me be really clear about this, okay? If you find somebody out there saying, oh, you've got to do this and this and this, be careful because ask to see the rules for why they're saying this. All right. Now, are there any wide open loopholes that we can all go through? No, not right now. I haven't found them. Have I finished studying it? No, I haven't. But I put a little bit of time into it. Other friends of mine have put some time into it. We mm -hmm. see where it's going. And I'm just giving you these preventative steps right now so that you don't lose a deal, particularly in the first few months of next year. So you've got a couple of on-the-shelf LLCs that you can slide right into the deal and away you go. So that's so get your identity theft insurance, form a couple of LLCs, sit them on the shelf and wait. And then as they get the bugs worked out of this, as things start moving forward, then um, go from there. Hey, if your filing fees are too expensive, pick a different state and then domesticate it back into Tennessee, okay? If your Tennessee is too expensive, like Texas, Texas is like 300 bucks. California is 800 bucks. So pick your poison, pick your poison. And candidly, I wouldn't lose a deal over a filing fee. That's just me. So, yeah, but everybody's got to pick what chooses for them. And we'll go from there. 
Um, Charles, if you got any follow-up questions, let me know. Uh, but that's that's kind of it from a high level. I do want to come back and I want to share with you some insight because you and I talked about it a little bit earlier today about, because I was in DC on Wednesday, where I think this nightmare in the house is going to end up going for a while. So, well, well, we'll come back to that. And we've got another question I need to follow up for uh, and on uh, Inspire. So, but on this issue, and and most of us are used to giving our banks way more information than we're ever comfortable with. Having said that, is there any way we can expect them to protect that information beyond just you know, I, I when they email me, kind of we, we talked about this, when they email me, okay, we just want to confirm this is your name, your birth date, your address, your your mother's maiden name, and, you know, here's your phone number and all this stuff on one form that they send back to me on, you know, unprotected email. It's like, oh, well, thank you. Just, just put it out there on the dark web. Charles, I saw exactly that two weeks ago. Paperwork coming from a bank on a large multifamily deal of which I was involved on one piece of paper, the buyer and the seller's identifying information, the human beings behind the entities, their addresses, their dates of birth, their social security numbers, their phone numbers, their driver's license number. And this was something circulated by the bank on an unsecure email and I just flipped out. I flipped out on it, but anyhow, so it's out there. So plan on somebody being sloppy, somebody being careless and your stuff being exposed. Plan on it, so buy the insurance ahead. And that's exactly it, get, get the insurance. We're not, we're not pitching anyone insurance or identity theft insurance, but get it uh, way cheaper than dealing with this. And the way it was described to me from, um, the Homeland Security FBI side is bluntly put, your information is already out there and, and your data is out there and it depends on how old the files are. And these guys are, and I say these guys, these these bad actors and or state actors. And by that, I mean, uh, North Korea, Russia, China. I'm literally looking at another update that just came in with North Korea on it. The active level of, efforts they're going after to go after our, our our intel our information malware hacking it those kind of things are they are extremely active right now and they're coming after everyone so it's just a matter of time um, i've had i think three different business cards that were hacked or false um, charges against them that i've had to change in just the last like seven months so you are, it's just a matter of time before you're pinged. And so you want to make sure you're paying attention and make sure you've got that insurance protection or to make sure you're covered um, yep. and make sure you talk with your bank about what their, what their standards are and the requirements. Jeff. You're yep. Right. So, I, and there is a greater effort than before to steal your information, scam you and run you through it. And yes, that information is already out there. And so that's why, that's why I've had not one, but two different, ID in theft, ID in theft insurance policies because I don't want to just trust it in one. I want to trust it in two of them, and I watch them compete against each other. Who notifies me first about this or that, and so on? And knocking on the wood of my desk, since I've had those two policies in place, I've not had to go back and fix anything. So that's been very nice. It's been very nice. Yep. Um. So, I'll Charles. I'll take whatever question you want to throw my way. Well, so this is a question and, and something we've kind of hinted at. Trust, land trust, trust. How does this, is, is this a shielding? Is this protective? What do we consider on this? And is it too new yet? The first reading I've done of the Corporate Transparency Act makes me believe that some beneficiaries of trusts will not have to be disclosed. But you're now placing a very steep burden on your trustee because your trustee is going to have to disclose a lot of their information. 
So if you think that you're going to just go form a trust and have some friend of yours be the trustee, you're putting you're putting a lot of risk on their shoulders. You're asking them to step into a lot of responsibility and you better be clear about it and you better be able to compensate them for that risk and that responsibility. So the question there's uh what is what, what qualifies as um the insurance or the ID insurance. Um, Daniel, you mentioned about LifeLock. This is non-endorsement. I'm not saying that. That is who I've used for number at least six or seven years now. Um, so just FYI, and, and I like the updates that I get, that kind of thing. So, so again, there's there's good companies out there, and if they don't update you on a regular day basis, I've used LifeLock. I've had no issue. I've used ID Seal. I've had no issue. I've used yep. a product sold by Xander Insurance out of Nashville, Tennessee. Yep. Fine there. So there's three, four choices. I'm sure Legal Shield's got something out there. I'm not endorsing any of these. Correct. But folks, I'm telling you, you've got opportunities out there. Go shop the marketplace. I don't want you to say, oh, I never heard. I never thought of that. Some of us have accumulated a few nickels to our name. Some of us have a balance sheet with a couple of commas in it. Don't be cheap. Spend a few hundred bucks a year to protect that stuff. So in perspective on that, we had a resident who wrote some false checks. I had one $1,500 and I pulled it off, took it into the bank. I'm sitting down with my uh, assistant bank manager. We're going through this and she gets a phone call while we're sitting there. And again, I'm in Cincinnati. This is a call from a bank in New Orleans saying, yeah, we've got a check here for, they, they want to do $1,500 on this account. And she's like, yeah, I'm actually shutting that account down right now. So no, do not cash that check. And, and part of this is heads up. That account was, I had it covered. So they flagged and, you know, I'm getting heads up like, whoa, you're get are you in this area? Because it doesn't seem like, you know. There's different things like that. Your banks will tell you that. Make sure your banks, if you're traveling, you can let your banks know where you're traveling to on certain cards and they will put their algorithm together so that they know that you're there. You know, especially those of us who go on cruises know this. If you don't, you run a card through and they're like, nope, that's not you. <laughs> they don't run it. So there, yep. there's some protections like that that can be in place as well. So encourage that. So plan ahead, plan ahead, folks, insure and plan ahead. Those are the two things I can tell you right now with corporate transparency and trusts may be an all viable alternative, but let me give you a couple of thoughts about trusts. A, they may be a viable alternative. You're placing a lot of burden on the trustee, a lot of burden on the trustee, a lot of responsibility. And it is exponentially much harder today to open up a brand new checking account at a bank for a trust than for an LLC. One of them is a relatively simple process for which most people in each branch of the bank have been trained how to do it. But when it comes to open up a bank account for a trust, that's going to have to go up to corporate and legal, and it's going to be a while. So the days of it being easy to do are gone. So just bear the, you know, what, Weigh and balance these things out and go from there. So I'm going to, if anybody's got more questions on this issue, come please enter them in the chat. Appreciate that. Um, Daniel, I want to go back to something you'd asked about the Inspire program at HUD. And so let me touch on this. Previously, there was what was called REAC. Uh, REAC was created in about 95, 96, um, really got involved about 99. The gentleman who created it actually worked in uh, Florida at a housing authority before for a couple of years before going to HUD and was tasked with putting this program together. I was actually at the was considered a nationwide event that they were doing in Detroit, and he rolled out how great REACT was, and I literally thought people were going to string him up. I mean, it... it the hostility of what happens with that because the program 
it's it's been bad. It's been bad for numerous reasons, including the fact that properties that none of us would stay at will pass, and a property that looks good and is safe and actually doesn't have local violations will fail. I mean, it's 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 a messed up program. Um, they have gone through HUD has gone through and they adjusted their programming and they've brought in this new product called Inspire. And it changes how inspections are done on especially project-based Section 8 properties and some of the other um, HUD-funded properties. And Inspire redoes the algorithm. It looks at it differently. It focuses more on the life safety issues that are actual life safety issues rather than hey, does every single window stay up exactly where it's supposed to be at exactly this height for an exact amount of time? I kid you not. Uh, is a vacant unit that might even be have painters in it. Yes, I can testify to this, be having seen it. They ask, the they ask the painters to step out of the unit so that they can check it. And then they mark it down because it didn't have the um, uh, electrical... Uh, little plastic covers on, you know, because it was being painted. <laughs> Look, are you serious? That's how bad the React program was. It is being transitioned over to Inspire. Inspire is aspirational. They are trying to make it a better program. And from what I've seen from some of the HUD staff involved with it, I've actually been impressed. I mean, compared to most of what I've seen there that has not been good. Inspire actually does pretty well on that. So just FYI on that, but that will be, you're gonna see more of that and it has been rolling out from a voluntary perspective and they will be transitioning that to mandatory as they're working out some of the, what they believe are bugs in it and such. So uh, I don't see any other questions on transparency. You are going to hear more Again, chicken little type syndrome. Oh, the sky's falling. You're going to lose all your protections. Please buy my program and get whatever. We wanted to give you that heads up. And, and as Jeff said, you've got through 24 really for compliance on this. To get the transparency out there. Having said that, if you're going to be doing deals in the beginning of the year, knowing that, let's face it, the feds and the state don't always <laughs> go together real well and could... So if you're going to be doing deals, you might have a, uh, a a shelf LLC or two ready to go rather than hanging up a deal. Um, this will be semi-invasive. We get why. But just understand that it will be coming and it will be going into effect. So. And yeah. it's going to be it's going to be a business decision that each and every investor has to make. OK, I'll give you I'll give you three scenarios that I see. Number one is you're going to say, OK, I'm going to wait and I'm just going to take my chances. Great. God bless. That's fine. That's what you want to do. I'm going to see somebody else go, well, OK, I'm in a state like Texas, Tennessee, California. They got an outrageous filing fee. I'm going to go ahead and spend the money. OK, fine. Do that. Or you're going to find some people who are going to be like, well, I'm I'm kind of very frugal with my money. I'm going to go set up a, an Iowa or a New Mexico LLC pay the $59 filing fee. And then if I got to bring it into my state, such as, you know, wherever I got to bring it into Tennessee, California, Texas, whatever, then I'll worry about it then, but it's already existing in 2023. So I have all of 2024 to file it with FinCEN. That may work. That may not work. I don't know. But what I do know is this, when you start to form new LLCs in 2024, yeah. That's when you're going to have to start complying immediately with CTA, Corporate Transparency Act. For LLCs that you have in 2023 and earlier, you've got most, if not all, of 24 to comply. So that's why I'm saying think ahead, get a couple extra ones and so on. I know I'm going to do that. Yeah. I know I'm going to have a couple. You know, I might even be kind of annoying and go, um, I might just say cta preventative one and cta preventative two is the name of my llc's just for grins and giggles you know so yeah um yeah that's that's kind of where i'm going with that one okay excellent yep. all right 
you know, that's what we have for you today. A little bit of info. And again, I'll, I'll reiterate this, this piece. Scams are going through the roof right now. Please yep. be careful. If you're traveling, please be careful. And as you bring in new residents, make sure you're being situationally aware and make sure you're being cognizant that the person you think you're talking to across the table is actually the person that's there. Yep. Yep. No. Yep. Charles, um, I'm going to flip back if it's okay with you. Let's, I'm going to just give everybody a prediction of where I think we're going to see this nonsense in the house of representatives go. Okay. Um, Do you want to be a prophet? This is uh, your risk. <laughs> this is my risk, but this is where I think it's going to go. Um, the speaker pro tem McHenry. Yeah. I think he's going to be given more and more power. There's a growing consensus. You're, Charles, you and I have talked about this earlier. There's a growing consensus among the Republicans that we work with that this is the guy that we're going to let him run it through the end of this year. Because if they don't do something, they're just setting themselves up to have be blasted all next year in the campaign cycle. Be blasted in the election cycle. That's already in place at this point. Yep. Um, we have a CR in place, folks, which is a continuing resolution because, okay, just, just to be clear, Congress has only passed their budget four times on time since 1977 when the budget process was put in place. So how would you like to have four times since 1977 you got your job done right on time? Or at least on time. We're not going to say whether it's right or not. That's a whole different debate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 so, yeah. So, but on time, yes. Continuing resolutions, ongoing, and the next continuing resolution is in what? Uh, it's on the fifteenth of November. And if the continuing resolution isn't passed, oh, guess what? The government's shutting down. Government's shutting down. Well, okay, we'll see. But that's that's what we're looking at. And that that deadline to get either a CR passed or what would really be done is the 12 different budget bills all passed. And even if they were done in an omnibus bill to get those passed, that's what's hanging out there. And, and as I say, that 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 time clock is ticking. So yeah, it is. It I, is. And, and everything I'm hearing from various aspects is exactly what you're saying, Jeff. That's yeah. McHenry will most likely be it just because they can't agree on anything else. And the number one qualification that most of them are looking for now is A, they don't want the job. If you don't want the job, you're qualified. If you do want the job, you're disqualified. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's and it's 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 a it's a sad it's a sad state of affairs. Um but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna make I'm gonna turn this in a little different way then and then Charles, I'll be done unless you got questions for me. Folks, the reason we're in this situation is because, candidly, we've not done what we need to do on a consistent basis. And that is there are not enough. The, the Republican majority is not big enough. And the Republican Party can't manage to control itself like the Democrat Party can for whatever reason. We need a bigger majority. And there's things that we can do to get there. And there's some stuff that you know, you're going to hear from Charles and I about in the future about ways to maybe get more seats in the House of Representatives for people with, you know, in a way that would further the interest of National Rio. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I'll honestly, leave it at that. I, I, honestly, it, it, it's it's in almost a majority stronger in either direction. And I know that sounds blasphemous to some of my Republican friends, but either direction would be better than where we're at sitting so close where it only takes a couple of people to think I can become the power, I can become the power broker. And that is not helpful. Um, it is not. Yep. yep. So that's that's part of the problem. So pray for our country and mm -hmm. uh, do what you can as we get into the local elections here. And let's, uh, let's get engaged and stay engaged, folks. Yep. That. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you for your insights on this, folks. Be safe and be aware out there. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend.